Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation to all the organizers. I had a, um, a quite long trip here coming from Chile, but I, I absolutely think it's worth it, and it's such an important topic that I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, to be here, so thanks for having me. I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities, uh, the threats and the policy changes in, in 10 minutes, so it's going to be quite a mix of different things I think I'm going to throw in there. Myself, I made myself uh, a name uh, once by estimating how much information there actually is. And there's a lot of information how it's, uh, how it's been growing. If you estimate the numbers, or if you estimate the amount of information, so it started, let's say, in the 80s when you're still analog, the white stuff is the analog information, the green stuff is the digital, and you can see how much it actually exploded here. While only less than 1% or 1% was digital in the late 80s, now it's almost all of the percentages is, is digital of the information that we have in the world. That doesn't mean that the analog information is less, it's just the digital grew uh, so much. Information, uh, the amount of storage information doubles every three years uh, right about, which makes, it, which makes it huge. And here you can see the transition as well from the analog to the digital starting back there at 1%. Now we are almost at 100%. We estimate the beginning of the digital age to be around 2002, so that's only 10 years back. It was the first time we could store more digital than analog information. Um, if you uh, think about the amount of information, in the late 80s, we could have covered all the world land masses with the informational equivalent of about a double printed newspaper page. There we go. <laughs> um, and that then doubled, as I said, every three years. So in 2007, we could have also covered the world land masses with the informational equivalent of one layer of books. In 2011, with two layers of books. And in 2000, uh, now 14, with about four layers of books. So next time you just like walk around every, and that includes you know, the last corner of your yard. It includes the last corner of the desert and, and uh, the, the top of the Himalayas. Everywhere is the informational equivalent of four layers of books. So next time you drive around with a train, or in the car, you look out the window, just imagine four layers of books lying around everywhere and, and, and think about who's gonna uh, uh, process all this amount of information. You can go again. And uh, the communication as well has increased tremendously. In the late 80s, we communicated the information equivalent of about two newspaper pages per day through the phone, through postal uh, exchange. This also doubled actually, it doubled actually quicker. And right now in 2014, the average person exchanges the information equivalent of about 35 newspapers, entire newspapers, and we receive about the information equivalent of 300 newspapers. So that's a whole lot of uh, amount of information, and we're working on quantifying that a little bit. Uh, so, so what is this, all this information good for? Well, if you're a traditional economist, and I work with them a lot actually most of the time, they look, the data, look at the data revolution somehow like this, right? So there's wealth, wealth creation, development, uh, whatever you might want to focus on. And they have this aggregate output and they use a traditional economic theory, the standard growth model. So you have digital capital here, some of that nowadays, uh, uh, capital here, some of that is digital. And then you have workforce, well, some of that is else also digital. And then you have something economists actually not, don't know, they call that productivity, it's, it's the residual. They usually don't quantify that. And that then leads to the aggregate output, right? So they basically measure how much digital equipment we have, how much digital workforce we have, and that then leads to economic growth. However, uh, if you look at it and if you think about it really, the trick of the, uh, the contribution of data to development and to economic growth is actually here in what they call productivity. And traditionally, economics, uh, economists usually don't look into that. Don't, they don't really know how to, how to relate information or data to something like economic growth and they must just use these proxies here for growth and, and leave that out. Now that is very, very dangerous because the amount of digital capital, for example, importance, uh, has less and less, important, uh, less and less importance because all over the world, let's say there is a standard of, of technological infrastructure and the amount of, cap of digital capital uh, matters less and less. So for example, here's the amount of countries. Here's the countries and the technological infrastructure they have. And we can see a kind of like trend, of course, less developed countries have less digital infrastructure, more developed countries have more digital infrastructure. And that's how usually how we measure it. But there's something also very interesting going on in this dimension. Here I projected the information processing capacity in kilobits per second. So here I actually measured real in the informational capacity. And you can see it kind of like that countries are hitting a wall, like from less developed countries, they go up here 
And then about, at about 2.5 devices per capital, we hit a wall and then we go straight up. That means in no country, there's kind of like a, there, you don't have more than 2.5 devices uh, per capital. That's kind of like a threshold. You have a mobile device and a fixed device and that's about it. So if I just measure the amount of devices or to, as a technological capabilities, I cannot explain actually the contribution of this technology to development and growth. What I have to do is I include, I have to also see the amount of information that you actually process. I have to measure bits and bytes, something economists usually don't do. And the interesting thing is there seems to be no limit, right? Because the question now here is, well, we obviously have a limit here about how much technology we have, but is there a limit on how much information we can process? Is there kind of like the same saturation process going in? Or is the sky the limit basically and always keeps on going? So what we have to do if we want to understand the role of information um, for development on growth, we have to actually move on to a theory that includes information per se as a driver of growth. Not only technology as a driver of growth, like economists do it. And in order to do that, and I thought I'd take a minute or two, um, to introduce you to these kind of new, new theories that we are working on, I have to go deep down the rabbit holes of where the information theorists actually live, such as this, the, the godfather of all of it, Claude Shannon. And I maybe do a 30 second primer. Well, many people of you uh, work in technology, so you might remember that maybe from college or from university, a little bit of information theory. So what is information actually, right? What is a bit? Well, Shannon is the one who conceptualized information as bits. A bit of information, uh, as defined by Shannon, reduces uncertainty by half. That actually what information is. So if you have real information, it is the reduction of uncertainty what you have. And that makes intuitively sense, right? Information is the opposite of uncertainty. If you have information, you don't have uncertainty. If you have uncertainty, you don't have information. If you resolve uncertainty, you receive information. Shannon called that communication. Right? Then the genius thing what Shannon did in the 40s, he said, well, if I define information in terms of uncertainty, I can quantify uncertainty with the help of probability theory. Bam! I have a, a scientific theory about it. Right? And so he converted information into a science. With that, he unleashed the, 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 uh, the total digital revolution basically with one paper in 1948. So how can we understand information in terms of uncertainty? Imagine I want to communicate you something. I want to communicate you the word genius. Right? Starts with the letter G. So I want to communicate you the letter G. That's how Shannon framed the, uh, framed the problem. So I have 32 letters here, and you have uncertainty about which letter I want to transmit to you. It could be an A, a B, a C, right? So I tell you, well, I reduce this uncertainty for you. How often do I have to reduce uncertainty by half? Five times, if I use the most quickest algorithm, which is a greedy search algorithm. And I've asked you the question, well, is the letter that you want to transmit in the first half or in the second half? of the alphabet? Well, the G is in the first half, right? So the first is, yes, it's in the first half. Then I ask you again, is it in the first half? And I at the answer to the question is, yes, it is in the first half again. So I transmit you a yes again. Then I ask you again, is it now in the first half or in the second half? So basically, Shannon told us that the reduction of uncertainty by half is the quickest way, you can show that mathematically, to reduce uncertainty and therefore to transmit information, to communicate. And what we have now here is a digital code which says yes, yes, no, no, yes, or 11001 if you want. And with five bits, I transmitted that information to you, right? That is how actually your cell phone works, how your computer works, how your internet connection works. And every bit reduces uncertainty by half. So um, that's, uh, that's, actually, that's actually how it works. So the, if you wanted to include this theory of information now into that's how Shannon explained it. He was a telecommunications engineer. But we can use the same thing for development. For example, for economic growth. It's the same logic. The same logic applies here. More information that you have, be it in your big data databases, helps you to reduce uncertainty and helps you for, for, uh, to grow. That makes intuitively sense, right? If I tell you, you have less uncertainty, you have more opportunity to grow. Makes absolutely sense, right? Even intuitively. So mathematically, you can imagine it like this. You have an, uh, an environment which is uncertain. You don't know if it's going to rain or snow tomorrow. Let's say you have six different possible uh, alternatives of the future for your developing country. The best bet you can make if I give you six dollars of resources is what? 
Well, if you absolutely don't know what's going to happen, the best bet that you have is you contribute each of the six dollars equally, right? We call it the maximum entropy principle, which also comes from information theory. And that's the best bet you have. That's what evolution does as well, right? There's many daughters and many sons and just distributes. And then we roll the dice. And what happens? Oh, it's going to snow. The one with the snow is going to survive. And at the end, you're left with one dollar. But at least, evolutionary-wise, you didn't kill your species, right? At least one of your species survived an uncertain environment. Now I give you one bit of information. Because I analyzed my big database, I extracted some information from this noise, true information, uh, real reduction of uncertainty, uh, real reduction of entropy. So here comes Shannon, one bit of information. Reducing uncertainty by half, what does it mean? Well, I tell you, for example, is the right side of the scenario going to happen or the left side of the scenario is going to happen? Now, I have this bit of information. I reduce uncertainty by half. I give this bit of information to you, and I say, well, it's going to be the left side. Never mind about the right side. It's not going to happen. I assure you it's not going to happen. Here you have a bit of information. I reduced your uncertainty exactly one bit. What do you do now with your $6? Well, now you can pick your cherries again. You know, you're, you're developing countries. You try to bet on the best industries. What's the best industry to come? Is it biotechnology? Is it whatever you want to bet on as a, as a finance minister? And then you say, well, now I, develop, I, I place my bets like this. I have, I have more information. I have less uncertainty. Now again, we roll the dice. And what happens? You double your growth rate from $1 to $2, right? Here you made $1. Here you made $2 for sure. Mathematically, it turns out like this, that the reduction of uncertainty by half is equivalent to a doubling of growth rate. And now the interesting thing that gets me excited, this two that you have here and this two here is not a mere coincidence. It is a mathematical equivalent. It is the same two, actually, if you do the math right. For those who are intuitively challenged, here's the math, but I think it's also very intuitive if you think about it right. I reduce uncertainty for you, and you have more potential to grow. So actually, that is a mathematical equivalence. And here now we have, this is H again, Shannon's entropy measure. So here now, we have a direct relationship between information, defined as a reduction of uncertainty, that you can extract from your big databases, and something like economic growth and development. And this is quite in contrary to the traditional theories of economics. I can, I can continue that. So for example, Shannon has a probabilistic uh, measure of of uncertainty in the bits. I can also give you a deterministic measure of the future. I can, now, the dynamical systems theory would say, I can describe you the system's dynamics. That means I tell you in the indefinite future how this future scenario will roll out. I say it's snow, sun, sun, snow, sun, sun, snow, sun, sun, snow, snow, sun, right? Then I give you this future. If I tell you the future, I describe it. I can codify it. For example, like Kolmogorov would say that's an algorithm in mathematical terms, you can reduce it with Kolmogorov complexity, compress it, then you have knowledge about the future, deterministic knowledge about the future, and if you have this knowledge, you can maximize your growth rate. Makes sense, right? So if I tell you the future, in a more nerdy language, if I give you an algorithm that predicts the unfolding of the future, then you can maximize your growth rate. How? By giving you this information that's basically a code, right? One, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, and so forth that can be compressed so I give you the knowledge about the future. Again, we have a direct relationship between information and knowledge that you can extract from big databases or whatever and the, the maximization of development, for example, uh, through growth. And therefore, information knowledge in these new kind of theories that we're working on becomes a quantifiable and a tangible ingredient for things like economic growth. And that is quite in contrary to the traditional theories that we have about development, which basically say all that matters is that you have a lot of cables, right, and, and, and processors. Actually, now we start to understand it's this one here, Solos residual, the productivity, the information, the knowledge that helps us uh, to drive growth. So that's just a little excursion to, to tell you about these new kind of theories that we are working on, but uh, reassuring you that, yes, information and knowledge is becoming, also in our scientific theories, a quantifiable and a tangible ingredient for growth and development. And more information, if it's real information, is better and is important for development. Um, 
Now, if you put information and the information capacities of countries into the center of attention, that also changes some of the general conclusions that we have or outlooks that we have, for example, on the digital revolution. Because if you think about development, also in digital terms and technological terms, in terms of technological devices and equipment and technological resources, what we usually say, for example, in the digital divide, we measure that and say, well, bring more devices and, and equipment to developing countries, that is better for them. What happens there is if we measure the digital divide, for example, technological capacities in terms of devices, is that uh, things became a lot better because we shipped a lot more devices to these countries, right? So for example, in 2001, the divide was about one to six uh, between developed and developing countries, and only five years later, this re uh, divide reduced to one to three because everybody now has mobile phones and computers and so forth, so great. We can all applaud ourselves and go home. The digital divide is closing. We did our job during the last 15, 20 years. There's a lot of technology now in developing countries. Let's all go home. The problem is if we measure that in terms of information and informational capacities, it looks quite different. While in 2001, the divide in kilobits per second of telecommunications capacity in developed developing countries was about 1 to 10, right? 50 kilobits per person to 5 kilobits per person. Five years later, the good news is that developing countries caught up a lot. <clears throat> they basically made up the level of developed countries, right? The developed countries here were 50 kilobits, and only five years later, the developing countries caught up. That is very good news. That opens in absolute terms possibilities, unique possibilities for millions and millions of people for the first time. That is very good news. However, what's a little bit the danger? <clears throat> is that the developed countries even took off much more, right? So the divide actually in informational capacities increased. So while the divide in terms of technologies is closing, the divide in terms of informational capacities is increasing, which basically means the knowledge, and I told you information is a tangible and quantifiable ingredient for things like economic growth. If you were with me on that, you also have to be with me when I say the divide between developed and developing countries is increasing because the information divide is increasing. The fact that we are applauding ourselves that the digital divide is closing is because we measure the digital divide wrong. We just count the number of cell phones. While disregarding that a cell phone is not equal to a cell phone. Some cell phones uh, process much more information than other cell phones, right? And if it's information what we talk about, that's what we have to start to measure. <clears throat> so that's one thing. Um, I said we have to start to measure information. Now, another uh, uh, benefits and threats of the big data revolution is, I said, well, if we analyze this information, that means that then we can make predictions about the future, right? And making this prediction is kind of like the creme de la creme of science, and this, of course, is the holy grail as well of the big data revolution. And making these predictions in real time is basically what that's all about, extracting knowledge from the noise, making prediction, reducing uncertainty, maximizing our potential to grow. So this is kind of like the typical graphs that we all know, right, from the big data revolution. You, I don't know, you use Google searches to predict unemployment or use Google searches to predict the dengue outbreak in Brazil. So you can see here the official data from the health ministry in, in yellow and the Google trend data. And you can see it goes pretty much one to one with the difference that Google is in real time. And you can now, if you have a lot of Google data, also make predictions about the future where the official statistics still don't work, right? So that's kind of like the holy grail of the big data revolution, using a proxy such as Google searches to make another prediction in real time and then pre make predictions, which here again, reducing uncertainty helps you to foster development. In this case, uh, fighting dengue outbreaks in, in Brazil. Um, and this goes a lot, for example, there's this famous uh, example that um, the UNDP came up with one uh, report with the poverty statistics. For example, it was claimed by this, uh, now the United Nations um, uh, agency, uh, it, came, it was claimed that you can use, uh, for example, uh, cell phone prepaid data in order to, to predict uh, poverty statistics in real time, which I think is a genius idea. I don't think we ever got the funds to, to implement that, but I think that's kind of like the spirit you have to think about in big data, right? So by the poverty statistics come like with a one or two year lag, it was suggested in this report that you take uh, cell phone prepaid statistics, every 
poor neighborhood has prepaid phones, you track them in real time. And since we know that telecommunications expenditure is kind of like a basic necessity, you, by tracking this data, can find a correlation with poverty. And then in real time, per neighborhood, can already predict poverty statistics. So that's kind of like the spirit of the big data revolution, right? We take some kind of proxy, extract knowledge from that, and make a prediction somewhere else. Now, uh, this can also go horribly wrong, this kind of like with the proxies. It's dangerous because often there are proxies and often that knowledge that we extract there, we shouldn't be too sure about that. Of basic statistics reasons and of others. For example, a, a story that just broke, I think, two weeks ago was the one with the NSA and the drones, right? Where they basically said, well, the NSA is using identifying terror suspects by a big data proxy, which is again as well the cell phone carrier. So they look at the SIM card, and whenever the SIM card is of this person, they assume that that is the prediction that that's where the person, and therefore the drone kills him. However, but the cell phone is not equal to the person, obviously, right? So the JSOC uh, drone operator then states in this report, uh, it's of course assumed that the phone belongs to a human being who is nefarious and considered an unlawful enemy combatant. Uh, and this is where it gets uh, very shady, because obviously the cell phone is not equal to the person as well. So this is now an extreme example how it can go wrong, but there are many other examples how it can go wrong, where our actually extraction of knowledge through these kind of proxies doesn't really and cannot assure you that it represents also how the future unfolds. Um, where it then becomes much more shady or sketchy is if we then use this big data, try to in, uh, reduce uncertainty, and even make predictions about what you're about to think yourself. And that sounds now a little futuristic and George Orwell-like, but it is actually uh, already happened, right? This news came out last month that Amazon is starting to ship things before you even thought about buying them. So what Amazon is doing, it ships orders to you before you even conceived about buying them. It, maxim it, it optimizes their inventory time by that, now, of course, it doesn't ship it to your house. It ships, ships it to a location near you, and they take big averages, but they have proven that they can reduce inventory costs tremendously by that. Basically, by analyzing big data about your shopping behavior, and they already know that you are about to purchase some diapers again next week. Makes sense, because if you purchase diapers for the last 10 weeks, it's probably also going to purchase them next week, so they make predictions. But actually, that goes in the, reduction of thought it goes in the direction of thought prediction, right? And it goes there, and that's what deep, deep, uh, big data allows us, especially if we live all these transparent lives. Where does this become sketchy? Well, it goes back to what Benninger called the control revolution. Benninger wrote a really fascinating book, book in 1986, which got very little attention uh, comparatively. Castells and others talk about the network society got much more uh, attention. For me, Benninger's book is actually uh, a tremendous contribution. And he, Instead of talking about the information society or the network society, he called about the control revolution as the origin of the information society, right? He defined it as a complex of rapid changes in the technological and economic arrangements by which information is collected, stored, processed, and communicated. Call it big data. Of course, he didn't know about that uh, 20 years ago. And through which, a formal and prog uh, through which formal and program decisions might affect social control. So actually, he says all of this is about social control. It makes sense that it is about control because as, as told you, it's about reducing uncertainty. If you reduce uncertainty, you have more control. Right? That's how information theory and cybernetics go together and so forth. So it's actually what we're dealing here with is a control revolution. And it's about social control. And that's also where it becomes often very sketchy because, of course, the highest level of social control that we have is, of course, the public sector. And it has been set up 200 years ago by a controlling mechanism that looks like this somehow. But of course, we have long stopped to execute the system like this. We actually started to introduce new kind of feedback mechanisms. And I tell you an example in order not to get you into modern examples, which are very, uh, very high in the newspapers. I give an example that's 20 years old uh, from the presidential campaign of Dole against Clinton in 1996. There they identified they did big data research, you might call it, on a lot of databases, and they found somehow the correlations came out with something that seems to be important in user behavior, and they found out the only thing that really correlates is that these kind of voters, they were all mothers, and their children were all doing soccer, right? If you analyze, for example, credit cards, the records, you can find that easily out, right? 
And they understood that soccer moms is an important swing group. So they just started to focus their campaigns on these soccer moms. You might have heard of this term. Right? It was basically a big data result. And actually, the Clinton campaign achieved a lot of voters. They achieved that these swing voters would then also change. Now, but what is what they are doing here? And that was 20 years ago, right? Not even talking about the last, the last couple of years. What they're doing here is they're fixing some kind of, of group, and they're trying to spin a message that fits this kind of group. That means that the feedback mechanism does not go from the people here, but goes the other way around. Or to quote a very famous quote, he who controls the past controls the future. Now, when I was talking about the last 15 years, talking this digital revolution, I often quoted uh, uh, our friend George Orwell here. And usually, people would laugh or stand up or shake their head. I even someone, I overheard one saying once, oh, you know, is this generation of Germans like him? You know, they have a bad conscience about the past. And they always have that. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. We want to talk about nice things here. The digital revolution and, you know, and all the great benefits we have, it's such a you know, such a, he ruins the entire mood by, you know, this. Well, during the last year, people stopped less uh, shaking their heads and standing up. But that's kind of like what we are also talking about. And what we learned during the last half year uh, is also, and especially in this case, is very, very worrisome. Because actually, it doesn't really matter to me if your privacy is lost for Amazon, if your privacy is lost for some commercial. That really doesn't really matter. And it's probable that we will lose this kind of freedom. We lose this kind of privacy in a commercial realm. It gets very, very sketchy if we lose this kind of freedom and privacy if the, dates, if the data goes in hand of those that we are supposed to control. It's a social control revolution. And that affects the highest level, right? And to keep on citing Orwell, what, you, what he says here is that by comparison to what existing today, all the tyrannies of the past were half-hearted and inefficient. And that right now. And when we're talking about bringing these technologies to developing countries, their institutions, are very unstable or even inexistent. We have to be aware of that as well. Because we even know that the strongest country, the countries with the strongest institutions of the world are struggling with this control revolution. And they have no idea how to handle it. So if we bring these tools to the least developed countries of the world, we have to be very aware of this aspect as well. OK, that closes it. The policy challenges as regulation, the last point as well. And incentives, I will talk about in my next presentation. Uh, in, the, in the breakout session, more about incentives, uh, how to incentivize uh, governments and countries to work on this open data revolution a little bit more. And so I talked about the opportunities. I said that this data helps us to contribute to development, especially growth. And it helps us also to understand actually what information knowledge is, which my academic side finds very exciting. And the threats, you know, there are new dimensions of inequality. As I said, the information gap is actually widening between the countries. We can make wrong predictions, which is da dangerous. In the most extreme case, we can kill the wrong person. And it's about information and control. And we have to be aware that that's what we're doing. We're changing control structures if we bring in data and information technologies uh, to developing countries. Thank you.